what is the role of ritual in processing grief? Earlier this year, I put out a call to my community. You probably got it if you're on my list. Um, inviting people to join me in helping me to develop a lesson around ritual. Uh, I heard from Cecily Engelhart, uh, but by the time I heard from her, the, the, the spaces were already full. But there was something about her inquiry that stayed with me, and so I reached back out to her, and I invited her into this conversation. Cecily is uh, an indigenous woman of Lakota and Dakota background. She's also a coach that wants to help you live the life you dream. In my experience, the only way we get to live the life we dream is by learning to contend with life and its terms. And there's something about ritual and something about how we contend with grief that actually makes us more fully human. It actually is essential to our becoming wise. I really love the depths of conversation that we got into here. I love getting to know more about Cecily uh, in this conversation. She's one of the people in the podcast that I've had less of a long-term relationship with, and yet there was something about her spirit that really led me to to have this conversation with her, and, and I think you're going to understand why I want to join us. If you don't know me, my name is Gibran Rivera, and I am a, a teacher, a guide, I'm a coach, and I'm a facilitator. And with this podcast, I am inviting you into what is an ongoing, decentralized conversation with remarkable people who are devoting their lives to the evolution of consciousness and culture. I think that your attention is invaluable. And I am so grateful that you're sharing it with us. Listen, give us feedback, and if there's something here that moves you, please share it. Enjoy. Hola, Cecily. How are you? Great to see your face again. Thank you. Thank you. You as well. I'm so happy we're talking. I want to say a little bit of a word about how this conversation came about and then talk about how we met, and then ask okay. you to say some words about yourself. Um, some weeks, maybe months ago, I put out a note to my list. And in that note, I was telling people that I want to develop a lesson about ritual, how people understand the role of ritual. And I was calling for like seven people, and so the number got filled. But then I got this note from you that talked about the role of ritual uh, in your processing of grief, which is something so important that our, I don't want to say ours, because uh, both of you come from cultures outside of dominant culture. But I feel like dominant culture doesn't know how to do grief well. I feel that grief is really hard, but it's the pathway to wisdom. When I when I call on the elders in, in ceremony, I often say the people who chose to elder instead of just get old, the people who know the wisdom on the other side of grief, you know? Yeah. Um, and so you and I met through some work I was doing with Hope Nation, work focused on Native folk, and you yourself are Native. And um, before I say anything else about you, I think you can introduce yourself better and, and tell us what, what that work was, uh, tell us what your work is now, tell us something about your heritage, you know, so people can place you uh, yeah. and your perspective. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm going to close a couple windows since it is like windy, stormy, snowy situation here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, thanks. So I'm just going to close everything else except our conversation. There Perfect. We go. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm Cecily Inglehart. I'm Ihangtuan and Oglala. Um, I live here on the Ihangtuan Nation. And I was, you know, when you and I met, I was working with Hope Nation with my beloved friend and mentor, Stephanie Gutierrez. And the work at Hope Nation was so, throughout the three years that I spent working alongside her, um, and we'd worked together previously, but when it was her and I kind of in this uh, cocoon of <laughs> of knowing and deepening our work, um, everything we did spanned from, you know, strategic planning to this, like, move, I think, from the purely... Um, like led from the intellectual to being led from so much more on both our parts, because I think right. we both have continually brought that in all of our work, but the way that we really took the time separately and together to deepen that about our work was really um, part of, I think our effort in connecting with you. Mm-hmm. And additionally, part of how we, um, have taken the paths that we're taking now. We both went through coaching programs and now um, I've moved into my own coaching company um, and she's shifted to toward primarily the um, nonprofit that we had spent the last three years building as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of, you know, professionally my background. Um, but for me, um, being a native woman and coming from a very mixed background and having kind of a lot of multiplicity within myself and within my family. um, I think that I have spent a lot of time unpacking and um, being really curious about what different things mean and how things operate within different um, cultures and communities And so when I received your message about this particular subject of ritual, it's something that had been recurring in other conversations. And I really felt like the conversation around ritual and grief was one that has been top of mind lately. Um, And so I'm really, I'm grateful that we're going to get the chance to talk about it uh, more deeply because it's important to me as a person, but also as a daughter, as a mother, as a partner, I just feel like it's a really important part of um, some of the biggest um, obstacles, challenges, and inevitabilities of life. That's right. Beautiful. Beautiful. I definitely want to dive in. Thank you for telling us a little bit about what you're doing. I feel like uh, uh, as somebody that's doing some coaching, I love to introduce people to other good coaches, you know? Um, and I feel like people, as they hear you speak, they'll understand um, what it is that you're bringing, which is, which is quite special. Uh, but before we jump into that main thrust of the conversation, I have some, I always ask people this question. I always ask amazing people this question, which is, what is something that you have w- once believed to be true that you have passionately held as true that you have vouched for and fought for you know that you have made part of your identity mm-hmm. that you have changed your mind about that you have learned something out that you no longer hold to be true or at least you know you no longer hold so tightly and mm-hmm. the reason why i ask the question is because i feel like we live in this completely polarized politics where people are, instead of like meeting each other, they're only doubling down. It's like, I call it, at least on the, on the left side of it, I call it like social movement fundamentalism. You know, <laughs> I, I, cause I grew up in a fundamentalist community and it feels exactly the same, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. It's like you can only believe this, you can't say these words, and you will be exiled mm-hmm. if you don't adhere to the dogma that we all hold to be true. And 
I find it so limiting in human relationships mm -hmm. and in true connection. It feels like it brings people together in this very brittle way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like, and so when I, I want to introduce people to someone like you, that's just like a remarkable human that's standing for goodness, but that you don't get here without changing your mind about something that you have otherwise thought was the complete truth about you. And I'm just wondering if you can get us started with a, mm. with a story about that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a little bit similar to what, what you're saying. Um, I think the coaching journey has been one where I've started to put a little nuance to some of the things that I felt but haven't necessarily been able to articulate around this. And I think, you know, in my adolescence, um, I just so strongly wanted there to be right and wrong answers mm -hmm. because the, um, I think, you know, adolescence is its own journey. It's its own thing of feeling so like, um, vulnerable and raw and, um, full of questions about who am I? What, you know, where am I? What is this experience of being? You're, you know, there's so many layers and emotions and, and processes happening. And so I think there was like the sense of grounding or um, stability or uh, certainty, right? That if I got the right answers, other things like the uncertainty of life would um, slip away. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me, um, in my teens, you know, depression set in, in a way like the, the ennui of existence was like very heavy. And, um, I've spent the last, you know, 15 plus years really trying to navigate that in a way that felt authentic and sustainable. And, um, it really truly wasn't until coaching that I got to the point of holding nuance in a way that I don't think I ever had before and understanding the, all of the things that I interact with that activate something within me or create a reaction within me and like being able to get a little bit of space from them to look at them um, with a lot of curiosity and instead of deep judgment. And so when it comes to things where I feel like I've adamantly laid down like this, this, or this doesn't happen or this, or this, you know, like where I feel like I've been relatively, um, confident in that is where I feel a sense of alignment for myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, and having the, the, ability to allow people to have that for themselves without making it about me. And that's really hard when you're a person that's walking around in the world and so much of what is about you is problematic to someone else. And right. it's being handed to you in a way that you can't ignore or hide from. Um, but I've come to this realization of, I thought if I didn't create confrontation at every experience that felt um, misaligned or felt um, oppressive that I was feeling mm -hmm. if I didn't, if I didn't do X, Y, Z. And then I had this realization because I thought I was an activist in my youth. I thought I'm an activist. I'm going to go do these things and I'm going to be on the front lines. And, and when that didn't sit right, when I, A, it didn't feel very good to me because it's not the thing that I'm designed for necessarily. Um, and I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> then I felt like, Oh, there's a lot of different ways for me to show up for the work. And um, so I've shifted my belief in what constitutes the work and in the permissions I give myself for where I show up. You know, being invited to be the first Native woman in a particular club or space or whatever, that's something I'm not interested in anymore. 
Like, I don't want to be the only standalone anymore, not because everyone there is bad or evil or whatever, but because I know the purpose and the outcome. I'm not going to be able to catalyze the space in the way that I would. So I communicate and create conditions that I believe I can serve best and that start a conversation about why that is. Because I feel I don't feel alone in that. I feel a lot of people are tired of being in certain positions um, and are also tired of and no longer feeling guilty for saying no or yes or whatever, um, even if people think it's wrong to not operate according to a certain (laughs) certain set of rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like we're giving into the rules. I understand what you're saying, and I, I'm really feeling it's like a like a shift in your internal posture right like Mm -hmm. the situation is often the same but how you relate to it starts to change and there's a different there's a different power in that right because you're setting the terms you're setting the terms you're Mm -hmm. not playing a role that you think you need to play that you have identified with you know yes absolutely that's awesome thank you for sharing that thank you for sharing that um so let's let's talk a little bit about ritual and about grief. I want to just say a couple of I like lay down a quick framework that I've been working with that was part of why I'm what I'm working on, what the, that call that I put out. And so it's by by a Western intellectual, like a like a a philosopher, a philosopher and cognitive scientist in the Western cultural tradition, a white guy called John Verveke. And, and I feel like in some ways he's given name to something that people like you and I have, have known, but, but their articulation feels helpful. So he talks about different kinds of knowings and he starts with propositional knowing, which is like, Uh, this is a phone or something like this is what God is, even if you can't prove it, you know, but you just kind of make asserting a proposition, right. And, and, and hoping that people agree with you or not. And some of them you do and some of them they don't. And it says most as a way of knowing and, and most of our dominant culture is caught in propositional knowing It's all in the head. And it's all in arguments based on ideas. And this is what you see on social media, right? I believe this. No, I believe this. No, you're wrong. No, you're terrible. Then he says another kind of knowing, and they're all related, is is uh, procedural knowing, which is more technical. It's like how to do something. Mm-hmm. From like how to ride a bike to even, ha- even the how-to parts of how to perform a ritual, you know? Mm-hmm. Like it's all of the things or... Like, if you're a PhD student, how to do a dissertation. If you're a coach, how to coach, you know? Mm-hmm. And again, these are not mutually isolated. They're all connected. Then the other one is perspectival, which is right now you and I are talking. And like, and you and the way I talk when I'm in an interview and my work and my care for what you bring is foregrounded, right? It's at the front and everything else is backgrounded. When I see my son tonight, my fathering will be foregrounded, mm. right? Mm-hmm. And everything else will be backgrounded. So you start to understand that you can take on different perspectives and then mm. you can start to take on the perspective of the other, you know, to get into real deep conversation. All of this talk is to get us to the fourth part. Again, they are all woven together. And that is participatory knowing. So it's like you are an agent, that you're a person in the world. The world is the arena, right? And like you do something and the world responds, right? And the world does something and you respond. So there's just a dance between one and the other. And so, so. His argument is that everything we do is almost like an implicit ritual. Like it's something that we're doing with our bodies 
to understand things. So he says, even that word, understand. I stand under this. I get it. Or apprehend. I'm getting this. Or, or leaning in, right? Like it all uses these body metaphors to use, right? And then he says that there's, there's explicit ritual, which is what many of our many cultures have lost. Like dominant culture has lost in many ways, and our cultures have kept some of right. And yep. and he says in that in that ritual, you're doing something, right? You're not just like thinking. My ancestors are with me, right? You you are in a ceremony a way doing things to call them in right and and he talks about even like a little kid throwing a cape and a mask on and the kid is not just playing at being that hero the play the kid is like embodying the archetype of that hero to yeah. understand it to know it better right so 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 this participatory ritual this thing that we actually do not just believe that would be propositional but do with our bodies and with our communities and with our songs and with our prayers and with burning whatever we're burning right like whatever we're doing dancing a certain way right mm -hmm. uh pouring tobacco like different practices do different things uh are like this ritualized ways for knowing something that is deeper than yeah. propositional knowing. So that's a little bit about how I'm coming into this conversation. Thank you. So, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. So I would love to hear if that makes sense to you and then for to hear from you, like what compelled you to write to me mm -hmm. and talk about ritual and grief. Yeah. No, I really appreciate that that framing because it does put language to um, some of the nuance and like depth, right? Whether it's named or not. Um, and, you know, in reading what you had sent out and sitting with my own reaction to it and thinking about ritual in my life, both in the sense of where it's been present and where it's been less present, um, it's... It's like a um at one point there was a light bulb that went off internally around the reality that even without knowing it on the intellectual level all of the grief processes that I had been through with one family um were doing things for mind body spirit for my for my being that I didn't realize were really integral to my process of moving through grief. And when my grandmother passed away, I was in Aotearoa at the time and had to be flown back. We like pooled our money together so I could come back for her funeral. Wow. And- um, By Aotearoa, are we talking about what the Western is called? Yeah. Yeah, great. I just interviewed yeah. somebody from New Zealand, by the way. <laughs> cool. and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm a Maori woman, so I, yes. I, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was there for a year, and during that time, I actually had two. I had two separate deaths in the family: one on my mother's side, one on my father's. And because I had, you know, we'd pooled all the resources together to bring me back that first time, I wasn't able to come back a month later when my auntie passed away. And so it was like this really sudden and stark example to me. One, because my, my mom's side of the family, we had not been through um, a close relative passing. I mean, we had, but it had been in the more, um, I guess, more extended family. And my mom's family was predominantly white, but my grandma was native and um, there was just a lot of, there's a lot of uh, layers, right? A lot of layers to that, especially being in South Dakota. Then my dad's family is more predominantly Native. And so when my grandmother passed away, my mother's mom, um, there was this kind of 
mm, collision of different perspectives on how to handle this time, what it looked like. And all of the pieces of everyone's grief were so high and the opinions about what should or shouldn't happen were very strong and very conflicting because as a group, as a like family unit, you know, it was big for my mom and her siblings. It was big for all of us as the, the next kids, you know, and it was a totally different experience from everything that I'd been through with my dad's family and the losses that we had endured because even extended family felt much, much closer and tighter. And so we'd been through processes before where when someone passes away, you know what to do next. You know what's expected of you. You, um, and it gives you this sense of, at least for me, it provided such a deep sense of structure in a time when you feel completely unmoored. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I realized was missing in this process with my mom's family, even though there were elements of it that were very, very um, meaningful and powerful for me. They were these standalone moments. Um, And then when a month later I was, you know, back in Auckland, my auntie passes away and I'm away from everything. I don't get to see her. I don't get to touch her. I don't get to um, witness any of the things that would happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so for many, many years, even sometimes still, I think she's down the road eight miles that way. Right. And so um, there were so many moments of realizing all of these pieces I had been a part of. Um, And I can go into greater detail on some of them, but it was just that year 2012 was the year that they both passed and it was such a like wake up moment for me around the importance and um gift that these rituals had had even though they weren't particularly um cultural if you will they were you can see the way that they were but some of them were really our family mm-hmm. and the way that family and history and culture had intertwined into these processes. So That's I'll stop powerful. there. No, no, you, yeah, I, I want to ask you more. <laughs> I, I'm really, get, I'm really getting what you're saying. Like the the distinctions between doing it, what you had like a lived experience of getting to participate and not getting to participate in in ritual and 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 the impact that that's had on you in terms of contending with these passings. What um, tell me something about the actual rituals, like, and mm-hmm. I understand some of them are family, and it's the cu- culture and family coming together, but what are the actions, right? Because to me, I keep in my, I to me, it always feels like something that you do, mm-hmm. not just something that you like. It includes prayer but it's more than prayer or it is a type of prayer that it has that involves your body, right? It involves Mm -hmm. your sense. It involves your senses. So I wonder if you could describe uh, a bit of how, how you did it when you were able to participate in it or what your family does it or how your people do it just so that people get a sense of, of ways in which we contend with the, with the hardest things that that face Mm us. So, um, you know, I think my first funeral was well before I was, was 10 years old. Um, and you know, I mean that, I think that even the process of being present at a funeral is its own thing. Um, cause I met people in college who had never been to a funeral, which mm. was just like, you know, um, <laughs> and so you know, I think the first one that was most distinctive for me um, was my grandfather's passing and being able to be there. He he died at home and being able to be there and like be with him in the after and be with like surrounded by family, like all of us were there. It was this 
in my young mind, it was this moment, right? Because it was this processing of like, he's there, but he's not. And the tears that came and the, you know, the holding of each other, that was, that was kind of a pivotal space, right? And then as I got older and started to realize, oh, when grandpa died, like all of us, and this is a common thing, but um, all of us cut our hair. You know, that that's oh, a thing wow. that many Native people do is they cut their hair. Um, but for us, we not only cut our hair, but we gathered it all together and put it in with him. Wow. And that has been something that has been consistent in my dad's family. That isn't, it's not necessarily something everyone does. <laughs> but for us, that process, you know, I remember all of my cousins and everyone taking their turn in the kitchen to have their hair cut and the significance and kind of um, community, you know, the, I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily the right word, but there was a bonding of all of us mm. going through that together, right? That ritual of honoring this person and sending a piece of us with them. Mm-hmm. And um, then when it came to my grandmother, my auntie, myself and my cousin, we couldn't have been more than, gee, I think we would have been 17 or so. I think I was 16 or 17 when my grandma passed. And rather than um, the funeral home, putting on her makeup and fixing her hair and doing things like that, we did it. Great. Yeah. And um, that experience, you know, it was something that I felt so was very important. Yeah. And there was, you know, obviously you're very present with that person and you're, it's an intimate experience touching their face, touching their hair, you know? And so it was a moment for me to, to be in that deep physical relationship, right? With this, body that had brought my father into being and brought me into being. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I had these memories, right? Speaking of ritual, she would always watch, she'd sit in her room and she would watch, um, uh, what do you call it? Golden Girls. And she would watch um, Unsolved Mysteries and, you know, America's Most Wanted, you know, all these different shows that she would watch. And I would sit in her room with lotion and rub her feet. And so for me, that, that moment of like being able to have time with her in that way, it was like the final time of that care, right. Of providing that care. And we did the same thing for my auntie who she didn't, she didn't wear lots of makeup or anything like that, but it was an opportunity to, you know, fix her hair and, just give her the look and style that she would have wanted. And um, again, like that, those moments of last, the physical connection, right? Um, And when my grandmother, my maternal grandmother passed away, the um, funeral home had never heard of anyone doing that. But I had asked my mom, would it be okay? Can I do that? Mm-hmm. And so she asked her siblings and um, her sister uh, had spent years as a cosmetologist. And so she immediately was like, we can do that, you know? And so she and I together mm-hmm. did her makeup, did her hair, painted her nails. Um, and it was just a really powerful moment to see the kind of like wonder in the the funeral home director's eyes, because I think to what you were saying, we don't have a lot of like, there's a lot of distance we keep between yeah. death yeah. and life yeah. instead of understanding their inner, how intertwined they are. Yeah. Um, but it was a very powerful moment for myself and my auntie to have this time with her. And, you know, we still, it, it's still something that I remember and then not having that when my um, paternal, on my paternal side, my auntie had passed away. 
when I was in New Zealand and having absolutely none of it, right? No final moment of that and no witnessing of my family, no um, being in the serving line for meals, no figuring out who was going to be on schedule to spend the night with the body. I mean, those things that like suddenly without them, I just didn't know. I didn't know how to grieve. I didn't know how to move through it. So I think, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, that's a no. I, this is incredible. Like the, just the, the call, I got goosebumps, you know, which means, means something for me, it always means there's a truth being spoken. And again, the, the, the painful distinction between one or the other are really meaningful. Some of what comes up for me as I hear you speak is, I think something like I keep referring to it as like Western dominant culture does in general. It's like everything is mediated and it's only more so, mm. right? Like a relationship, right? Like, like the kids are connecting, they're more comfortable talk, texting than talking to each other, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, um, like, look, I am all for the state, the government taking care of people more than it does. At the same time, it's like that thing that we take care of ourselves gets outsourced, you know? And it's like, uh, I was also, you know, I've been talking to some very powerful women who are mothers who are divorced mothers who are professionals and it's just like or even not divorced ones and it's just like even if you have a partner and you're bringing a kid up uh it's so hard without community it's impossible it's not meant to be done without community in fact one of the books that i that i'm going to talk about with you in this conversation it's a beautiful book called The Wild Edge of Sorrow by, mm. by Francis Weller. And it's about grief, you know? And one of the things he says that has always stuck with me is that our first grief, and again, this might be less true for you and for me, but for many people in the dominant culture, is that when we're born, we're born on, onto two, two to six pairs of eyes our parents and our grandparents, right? When we're supposed to be born to at least a hundred pairs of eyes, right? When we're supposed to be like moved around from person to person, right? And that from the beginning, we carry this wound. And I feel like, I feel like the culture atomizes or separates us from these things so that they can sell each one of us a refrigerator, each one of us a washing machine, each one of us a car, right? It's better for capitalism for everybody to have their own thing. But it's also like it separates us from the things we can do together all the way until taking care of our dead, right? Mm. Which is something something that, that you are participating in or have participated in in a way that just most people don't. It's outsourced, right? It's just somebody else is handling it. And that that breach and it's even like it's even like i always think about when someone dies you get all of the attention like that first week right and then you're left alone right like and it's just it's such a strange way it's such a strange way to do it um and so it's like the lack of ritual, like I was, you know, in the same book, maybe a different one. The other book on grief that I often share is called The Smell of Rain on Dust, Mm -hmm. which is from like a Central American indigenous perspective. And the the guy is called Martin Prechtel, I believe. And, and, And one of them talks about, I don't know, something like Scandinavian, old Scandinavians where the person gets to grieve as long as they need to grieve and everybody knows that they're in grief, right? And like, if they're going to wail for a year, then you're going to bring them food, you know, mm-hmm. all the way until, until they come back together, right? And what I've experienced when I've grieved, truly grieved, 
is that I come out wiser and stronger, that you can realize your heart can break to a thousand pieces, right? But you're still here. So you can actually love more. You can be more compassionate. You can be braver. But it's not just the loss that does it. It's the ritual that gets you through the loss. Thank you for the gift of your attention. If there's something here that resonates for you, something that feels true and good, think about a friend that you could share it with. We curate for each other. And that's the only way the good stuff spreads. I'm realizing as you were speaking, especially in relation to one, the outsourcing, but two, this lack of that kind of um, envelope is not the right word, neither is cocoon, but like this, the inner connection of a community that's kind of like, you know, g- creating this space around people right, and holding them. And after I had emailed you back, I had a moment of temporary, like, what am I doing? Why, why did I send that? Because I am so uncomfortable with grief. Mm -hmm. And I created this time of reflection for myself because I realized I'm uncomfortable with understanding where, what my role is in relation to others' grief. Uh Uh-huh. Because for me, the process is so particular. Yeah. And I've often never wanted to burden someone with my grief. Yeah. And so on the other side of that, I've never wanted to force or push or um, make anyone. I, either I didn't want to bring it out if it's something they weren't ready to bring out. Yeah. And it's something I've always wanted to be able to hold space for. But because there is no guideline for that or hasn't been built into friendships, into mm-hmm. fam- certain family relationships, you know, there's certain things where it feels very foggy to me. Yeah. And so after that momentary, like, what, oh my gosh, why am I trying to talk about grief? I thought, that's why, though. Because... Right. It is that integral thing. And I can think of many, many times in my life where someone I have cared for deeply is in deep grief. Mm -hmm. And I have felt very um, clueless. Mm -hmm. I have felt completely clueless as to how to show up for them rather than asking or engaging in that. And I think that's something that as I've started to build out more friendships from this point in my life, it's something that I've started to actually engage in in conversation because I want it to be an intentional, an intentional thing that I know I can provide and share and exchange. Um, Because in the past, even with people who I'm still very close with now, I don't feel I've showed up for them in the way that I think I, I could have. Yeah. And So that's something that I think is prominent in my mind. And um, seeing the discord that can happen upon death, discord between family, friends, et cetera, it prompted conversation within my family of wishes and desires for that time. And so it's prompted conversations for me, my dad, my partner, my mom, and we've spent time in deep conversation around what do you want? What's important to you? You know, what, what can I commit to all of that? Um, Because I think that piece of honoring the person and being able to do that with clarity and ritual, (laughs) Right. right? There's, you know, the actions to take because you've taken the time to look at it and to talk right. about it rather than shy away from it and pretend it's never going to happen. That's right. 
I think that's right. I think you're speaking the truth, and and thank you for like for the honesty. It's like, yeah, we need to talk about this a lot because we're not, and and because we have ways that we can learn from. We are, we have ways that we've forgotten, but we're like closing off, right? We're closing off to our older cultures that there are ways that merit remembering, and uh, yeah. You know, there's this folks. I wish I remember the name of the cards. I'll try to find them and put them in the show notes. But there's, I had some friends that made up a deck of questions. You know, questions for deep conversation. But these were all about death, right? So that families could pass, like, sit around and pass these decks around and. Each answer a question so that you could have all of these conversations ahead of time. Otherwise, it happens and there's no agreement. And like, you even get extorted financially, right? Because it's like people, you're in pain and like, they're just gonna, they're gonna want you to pay for the most expensive casket at the most expensive. But it's just like, if you don't talk about it, you know, like I, I said often, I want, like there's so these suits that are like made up of mushrooms, right? That help your body decompose, right? And like that's what I want. Like I want to put that in my will, right? If I can afford it. Uh, but but around when COVID started, when we didn't know what was happening, my family and I had the most beautiful set of Zoom conversations. And we had never we talked to each other. We loved each other. We had no idea how bad this was going to be, who was vulnerable. You remember those early months, right? Yeah. And I remember my brother and I, my brother let it, you know. But he's like, look, if something happens to me, um, don't worry because... He goes like been he's been into he's been through ceremony mm-hmm. often enough to know that it's just a change from one form to the next. So that there's not that fear, right? And so was I was able to say the same thing. It's like ceremony has taught me, right? I've died so many times in ceremony, right? Like I'm being through the terror of it, right? And it, and I it helps you. like the, So the, we're talking about the ritual for grief, but there's all kinds of rituals that you can do beforehand to like, to change your relationship to death, right? That they, mm-hmm. they're saying mm-hmm. that a warrior, right? A warrior befriends their own death, right? And they keep it out front. So I'll share a story that, I, that is quite recent for me. I sat in ceremony with my teacher, so I have a teacher because I, I hold ceremony. So I have a teacher that is an elder, you know. He's got more than 30 years of experience over me. And he teaches me how to hold it, how to do the healing, and uh, or help the healing, support the healing. But the way he teaches me is because I'm going through it myself. So I take the medicine, and, and, and I thought that I knew what this particular amount of this particular medicine was going to do to do because I had experience. But... Because I was with them, something in my psyche knew I was safer than usual. And in that, in that, I, my mind went farther, right? And it ended up being way harder, right? Like the ceremony was way harder. I was shaking and making sounds and throwing up and it was but also more part so so i go through hours of that right and then it comes down i start to come down but i'm not down it's just like the the wrenching part stops and then i start to just talk to god and i'm having the most beautiful divine experience between me and god i'm in conversation with god i am thanking god for for choosing me and loving me and telling god that that I'm completely his, right? Like whatever, like I'm just, it's just holy. It's like a, it felt biblical to me, right? It felt like one of those things. But I tell you this whole story because finally, after I'm having this holy experience, I am made to confront my biggest fear. 
mm-hmm. which is the fear of something happening to my son, right? Mm-hmm. And that every parent has that, but yep. my grandparents lost their oldest son when mm-hmm. I was five years old. So I had a traumatic experience of witnessing that, of witnessing my grandmother wrenching in the deepest pain a human being could feel. And I didn't know what to do with it, so I put it away. But I knew in my heart of hearts that anything can happen at any time to somebody that you love. And and what I did with that fear is I hid it. And in that moment, it didn't even feel like a truth of something that could happen. What the medicine was doing, it was like, making me believe that it was going to happen. So I had to like, it it felt like a prophecy that I had to deal with, right? So I was terrified. And I was like, a minute ago, it was God's best friend. And now I'm just begging God, right? Not to do this to me, right? Um, It was heart wrenching. But in the middle of the prayer, I knew, and that's a ceremony, that's a ritual that is helping me to contend with death. And I started to pray. I said, Please don't let me take this fear and put it away. Mm -hmm. Let me not hide from it. Let me live every day with the awareness that the worst thing can happen. Not so that I'm living in pessimism, but so that I can live fully, so that I can tell the people that I love that I love them. You know, every time Tuesday, Tuesday is my beloved, my partner, and like I'm just incredibly in love with this woman, right? And and every day, like almost every day, like we have these conversations at the end of the night because we live apart a lot. And I, but even when we're together, and I'm like, pause, and I'm like, this is it. We're having our life right now. Mm-hmm. If anything happens to you, and any or anything happens to me, let not spend any time sad about what did not get to happen. Let us always be grateful for the miracle of this love, which is greater than most people can experience, you know? So it's like the ritual around it prepares you to contend with it too, you know? She doesn't say you don't feel the pain of it, but like you have ways to prepare, right? To contend with the inevitability of loss and tragedy in your life. It's like, um, it's like that moment after I had the temporary panic after the email, (laughs) (laughs) because I knew it was because at the root of it was this very conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm so grateful to you for sharing that because I think like what you're saying, it is something that every parent contends with. Yeah. Um, and although I wasn't alive when it happened, I was, I I believe, I'm not sure if my mom was pregnant at the time or not, but, um, my, um, my dad's brother died very young. Mm -hmm. And so I know my grandmother had an extreme, extreme bout of grief. Um, and he died the year before I was born. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, that has been a component of our family story. And on the other side, there's a, a similar, um, a similar story and like the absolute terror of parenting. Like there's so many layers to that terror, but because there's so many layers of love, there's so many ways to love and so many ways to experience loss. Yeah. And, uh, I think that has had a tremendous grip on me being someone who gave birth at the very end of 2019. And then immediately there was a pandemic and navigating all of that as a first time, you know, mother and myself and my partner and my dad all living in a small house together and trying all of our best to make ends meet, but also protect this, baby you know (laughs) and um i think that that fear then comes out in so many ways that we hide from it like you were saying don't let me hide from it don't you know don't put it away and um 
that is, there's no structure, I think, in dominant society outside of like going to therapy, which right. not to do therapy, but it is, it is very intellectual. It yep. is very, you know, it's the, um, it's something that doesn't exist in, as you were saying, like certain action and there's yeah. a level of spirit lacking there. And so, That's right. um, this is just such a, a timely conversation. I'm grateful for it. And it's spurring a lot of thought around how I contend with that fear of something happening to my child and how much that informs almost every decision I make. Right. Right. And so yeah. if we walk around contract, because what you learn is that the fear is not going to change anything. It's mm -hmm. not going to make them mm -hmm. make them safer, right? <laughs> and so that's that's what is. But you also learn that every day is a miracle. Mm -hmm. So to hold that top of mind is not to be morbid, right? It's to like not waste time, right? Yeah. It's to love. It's to love. And uh, you know, I have. Um, I have struggled with addiction and one of the things that I've worked on is like the most, one of the most important things for me to be sober is the slogan, live life on life's terms, right? Mm -hmm. And life terms is like you're not in control. Yes. Life terms are like there will be grief, there will be loss, right? And 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 so much of like addiction to alcohol, to pot for me, like it, another, but whatever people are addicted to sex or anything people are addicted to is so much of it is you're afraid of life's terms. You're run, you're trying to create control over your state, right? Yeah. And so it's like every I just keep trying to accept the terms including something as small as I am not excited right now because I need, I feel like I always need to be excited, which is <laughs> right. Like, I was like, no, yeah. I need to be, I need to like be in the mundane. Right. I need Absolutely. to be in the non exciting. Right. But even uh, that, I think is part of the trauma of that loss. My therapist helped me to see it. It's like, you know, that death is real and you think that if you're not, lit up all the time you get, you're gonna die right like mm -hmm. it's like the trauma one response was to give me this thirst for life yeah. but it also made me afraid of the mundane yes absolutely you know? which is very <laughs> interesting i um i love i love doing personal assessments and things like that yeah. and um i recently revisited one with the the enneagram yeah, I love and, it. Yeah, and I'm a seven, which is me the too. <laughs> yeah, okay, I was suspicious, but it's so interesting because the root, the the root um, emotion is fear, right? And then yeah. I re read the description recently, which was one I hadn't read before, um, and in it they were talking about you, you chase novelty, excitement, all of these things because you are hiding from negative emotions. You are running from negative emotions. And then, and I was kind of mad when I read it. I was like, you know, I had this really like F you reaction because I was like, I have been sitting in depression and I, and for, you know, over a decade and I feel like I'm finally moving through that. And I was like, oh, I'm really moving through that. And not, it's not the, in the forefront of everything anymore because I turned toward those feelings. Yeah. I turned toward all of it. I stepped into it. I excavated myself in a way that wasn't the extraction of capitalist, do better, do better, do better. Yeah. It was in the gentle curiosity of figuring out what makes up my being. Yeah. And that shifted everything and so rather than being really hard on myself about oh you want to chase things right i understand the purpose of that and i can indulge in it 
in the way that makes sense for my well-being and nurtures my growth rather than keeps me from it or distracts me from it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. I'm so, I'm so glad you're a seven. Like, cause when you were saying that, I was like, I wonder if he's ever taken that. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I know uh, people for people who are listening, I'm making a note here so that people can look up the Enneagram. Uh, to have, I'm making a, a good number of 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 notes for for the for the show notes. It's different okay. things we've referenced. I think I want to say maybe one more thing as we move towards the close. Okay. And I learned this from Juanita Robertson, who's actually interviewed in the podcast. We can I'll, I'll link to that too. She said something that has really helped me in doing healing work for others which is that one of the first things you have to do to heal from trauma is grief, right? So something terrible happened to you as a child, right? Like oftentimes when people come here before the altar, it's uh, sexual violations, you know, it's, it's, there's so mm -hmm. much of it. It's so much more than we talk about. Mm -hmm. And Basically, something was taken from you that you you actually can't get back, right? You can heal, right? But something happened to your innocence. You have lived with shame for a long time, even though you had no guilt for it. Like, there's this. And so before you even get into, like, the positive side of your healing, you just need to grieve. You need, it's like, I say, it's like somebody died in a car accident and you can't take them back. Yep. Something happened to you as a child that was terribly unfair and it cannot be undone. Yep. And the first, like, before you eat, and you can look, I, the pe people come through ceremony and people come to therapy and people come through groups and people do heal. I see people be ter turn their trauma into medicine as opposed to like mm -hmm. like like some of this cancel culture kids who are like using their trauma as like a batch and like a they're like weaponizing it that's not what i mean people are healing from it but they had to grieve yep. they had to be like cry it out and that's like maybe that's the last thing I'll say about grief and then, and then give you the last word, which is, I think some of the basic things people need for grief is space. Mm -hmm. It's understanding that some of it is done alone. It's understanding that some of it is done together. It's understanding that you can go to ceremony for it. And one big thing that I learned is you got to cry. So when I've been in grief, you know, I'm a Puerto Rican man. So somebody had to give me permission to cry, you know, a, a healer. Once you give me permission to cry, I was cry I, I cried every morning. I cried every night. I cried in the middle of the day. I would run to a chapel to cry for months, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need some friends that are going to let you say the same thing over and over again. You know, mm -hmm. like literally say the same thing. Like your story you got to repeat it. Like, why did this happen? She was like this. And like, I wish I had done that. And like, you actually can't be embarrassed of saying it. And your friend, your close people, more than one, got to be willing to hear it until you're done with it. You know? So when we have somebody in grief, we make room for them to cry. We help them eat, we check on them, and we let them repeat themselves over and over again, you know? I think those are some of the easiest ways to to help people uh, with their grief. Any other thoughts that you have? Oh, aside from that, first one, like, what do you know about helping people? And then anything that you want to share before we close? No, I appreciate that so much because I think this conversation so much was not even in the realm of what I, what I know 
helps other people. It's been very much grounded in my own experience of like having so much distinction between what has or has not supported the journey of grief. And um, hearing you say that, it, I mean, I'm already coming up with all of these ways in which I, like people I will leave this conversation and reach out to. Right. And I think that um, what you said about healing and the grief of not only those that we've lost through death, but the parts of ourselves that we have lost that we don't get back, right? That That is a, a there's a healing that happens there. And I think about, um, this is in a different vein, but I think it's important to some of the things that we've talked about. Um, Barbara Sher, she wrote this book, about like basically, you know, you're having your the life you really want. There's the life you think you should live, and then your the life you, your real life. And she talks about how wonder, wonder is one of the things that people lose. And you go from imagining that you're going to, you know, be a superhero or an astronaut or, um, you know, a person that is connected to your community in a meaningful way, or like all of these things, right? These ideas of what around you cultivates wonder and within you cultivates wonder, even if it's rain, a rain puddle, right? Mm -hmm. And then when that goes away, the world loses so much of its luster and That's so right. much of that, what we were talking about in terms of... Um, that ability to look at a partner or look at a child or look at a scenario and be like, this is my life. I'm living it. I feel it. I smell it. Yes. And suddenly you're moving through the motions in a way that are very disconnected. And like you're saying, outsourced. Yes. So I think wonder is one of those things that is, um, by turning toward our grief, we increase our capacity to heal enough to allow wonder yeah. rather than pessimism. Right. Uh, and that is something I'm very committed to because I think it is such a way of honoring the miracle. Like you were saying, every day is a miracle. It's it's a way of stepping into that honor. Yeah, I say, I say, I say, I say. What a beautiful way to end here. I just want to take a... Uh, Take a pause to experience gratitude. And this disconnection that we're feeling and just the, what a thank you for the instinct, you know, to, to reach out. And I can't wait for people to hear this. I'm going to ask you three more questions if you have the time. There should be briefer. <laughs> there should be brief. The, the last one just to be thinking about is like, how should we find you? Because you're a coach and you're an artist. So just make sure that by the end, and I'll put it in the website too, but mm -hmm. by the end, just like people, I want people to know about your art. I want people to know about your mm -hmm. coaching. Yeah. The other ones are these. So the first one, I, I try to close with this one every time. And it's like, if you're okay, I'm going to invite you into a time traveling exercise. Mm, okay. I want to invite you into picturing yourself 20 years from now. You've accomplished certain things. You've failed as other, at others. You've gained certain things. You've faced some losses. Maybe a whole new generation has been born and is growing. And you have a different wisdom with you. And I don't want you to tell me who you are then. What I want you to do, what I want to invite you to do, is let that person 20 years from now that you look at you right now and tell me what they are saying to you. What of that wisdom would they offer you?
there's so much coming up around presence and the serenity. I mean, there's just something there around allowing time for my mind to be quiet. Yes. Because it runs so fast. Right. And there's so much around trust in that and trust that I'm held and things will unfold as they will. Yeah. And the sun still rises and <laughs> the wind still blows. And that there is a level of uh, freedom in that. Amen. Ashe. That is the truth. You're so wise. And <laughs> I also, like, I also know in my heart of hearts that as much good work as I'm doing, it will be even better if I slow down and do less so that mm. it can have greater impact. And it's as a seven, it's a hard thing to do, but yes. I just feel very aligned in that. In that. Then the other question I, I always like to ask strong, wise women, which is in this kind of post Me Too world, when the the insanity of patriarchy has been exposed, right? Mm -hmm. um, what? So I work with men, right? What should men do to be better? <laughs> what is your advice as a as a woman? Wait, what is your advice to men? I think that is, that's one of those things too, that's so contextual mm -hmm. because of the roles that we all play. And I think that what you were talking about earlier, like what's in the forefront when you're in this conversation mm -hmm. versus what's in the forefront when you're a parent <laughs> versus all of those things. Yeah. And I would say that I think something that would wield great power for deeper connection would be to both the co combination of the humility of doing and stepping into and practicing things that are, um, that you could easily feign. What's the word like weaponized? Yeah. Um, ignorance a little bit um, but the humility to step into things that feel you know like beneath you and also the belief of like what we were talking about earlier there's wonder and greatness in all of these things that I think often get seen as the unimportant work like there is so much life and meaning within things that seem unimportant right and often within partnerships, I think um, the the domestic, like the realm that's so often sh pushed only to women, yeah, um, and therefore seen as less important. Right. It's some of the most critical community binding work that can um, that can hold space for you. Yeah. Right. And so. I think being in deep partnership in that work is really important and understanding the knowledge that's there and the skill that's there. This is going to sound way out of left field, yes. but like the, the skills, these like hidden skills that women so often have, and there's, you know, increasingly many, many men who understand these skills when it comes to things like being able to like, <laughs> this is so goofy, but like the skill and precision of putting on eyeliner in a moving car, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that awesome. Is the yeah. same. That's the same as like 
the steadiness, the balance, the focus, the precision of like surgery, right? And not because the two are equal, but understanding that all of the skills and the things that we implement, the planning, holding, as they call it, the mental load, the mental agility that happens as a result of taking some of that on. Yeah. And then similarly, the bonding that happens that when you, when a when a partner i mean if you're a if you're a straight man the bonding that is allowed because your partner feels valued as a person right. is immeasurable but then also the way you're able to model that yeah is to me to me that is a very very big dose of medicine that would radically shift everyone's capacity yeah and would impact couples of every kind, right? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's so helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, yeah, I'm also a heterosexual relationship. And, uh, you know, Tuesday and I are very committed to supporting couples work where, mm-hmm. where people who are, who want to be identified as feminine, and people who want to be identified as masculine, and you don't have to, but some of us are. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I identify myself as a masculine man, which doesn't mean that you shouldn't be other than that, but I, that's what I am, right? And I am yeah. attracted to a feminine woman, which doesn't have to mm-hmm. be, but that's what, what she is. And so there's something about the dance between masculine and feminine energies when you're willing to do it, when it's not forced on you by society, but you're mm-hmm. intentionally playing into it. That yeah. is, that it's not only beautiful, but it but it can be really hot, you know. Like it can, yeah. it, it, it can, right? It brings an eros to the relationship that that people not don't pay attention to because they're not mm-hmm. they're not playing with that polarity when their bodies yeah. and their and their cells are meant to. Uh, so thank you for that. So this has been magical. I am so happy we did it. I'm so feeling the gratitude of it. Anything that you want people to know about you and where to find you, again, there will be some show notes and and you'll get an email from, from our people so that you can send us links. But um, what do you want to say right now about finding you and about um, yeah, doing work with you? Anything? Yeah, absolutely. No, And I just want to name my immense gratitude for this conversation. I had an instinct that it would be a really powerful conversation, but I was not preparing. I was intentionally not doing a bunch of things to prepare what I would say. I had so much trust in the way it would unfold, and I'm glad that I did. Um, in terms of where people can find me, um, my uh, my company is Cecily Rose LLC. My middle name is Rose, and so okay. that's the that's the company name. Um, and that's www.cecilyrose.co, C-O and not com. So okay. that's a space where people can go to find me. I'm also on Instagram under the same name. Nice. Beautiful. Um, and then for my arts practice um, and, you know, the spelling of these and all of that will be critical for anyone yeah. who's looking. So I'll let the show notes um, yeah. provide that. But my arts company is called Rosie Mato. And that is, it means Rosie Bear in Lakota. How do you write it? Yeah, absolutely. It's M A T H O. M A T H O. And Rosie, R O S E Y? R O S I E. I E E. Great. So we, have to put it, <laughs> we have to have it in the show notes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And I'll send, I can send all the links and everything, but yeah. um, I am most recently, one of my biggest things is I'm making um, parflesh purses. So Ooh. they're purses out of rawhide and I'm working on my first carry on, um, carry on like airplane luggage type, type of parflesh bag. So mm-hmm. that's like, I just want native arts to be very active, not, you know, on display and in a museum, which is fine, which is wonderful. It's, but I want it as the active every day. I'm going to the store. I'm going on a trip. Beautiful. You know, Beautiful. so that's that's where I'm at. Um, that's people exciting. can find me. In my, so, that's yeah. exciting. Well, I will let you go with this, which is I've already released an interview called Decolonized. Mm-hmm. Um, 
by uh, uh, an interview with a Maori woman. Oh my God, her name is suddenly escaping me. It's unfair. It's an incredible interview. <laughs> Cassie Hartendorp, right? Okay. Uh, I've already interviewed your former business partner and mentor, Stephanie mm -hmm. Gutierrez, that's coming out. And the, 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 the next interview that is coming out is with Jihan Giron, who you might know. Okay. Uh, she's, also, she's a Navajo artist. Um, oh, okay. And also okay. a black Navajo artist. Um, a former, and also a climate activist. But uh, so if you're not already uh, on the subscription for the podcast, there's been some amazing ones. And I think these thread together very powerfully. So I thought I about it. Jihan because of the art, especially, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to it and so glad that we've connected. Many, many blessings. And uh, we'll hear from us very soon. Okay. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Signal versus noise. There's so much competing for our attention. And I am so glad that you stayed with us through the end of the podcast. It should mean that you're finding something meaningful here. Hopefully, something worth sharing. And so I'm asking again that you think of somebody who would be touched by this conversation, who wants to be a part of it some way. It is a decentralized conversation. It is a way in which we're changing ourselves by leaning in towards each other in places like this and in the exchange of these ideas. So who's a person or two that will be specially moved by what you've heard here today? Send them a text, an email. Let them know we're here. We are not trying to reach everybody, but we wanna reach the right people. We wanna keep having this decentralized conversation. We wanna keep working on getting right to the edge of the evolution of consciousness and culture to see what we find here together. Thank you again for being a part of this. Liking the podcast helps. Subscribing is definitely a good thing. Feedback is always welcomed. Stay in touch.